do the first part of the project, which is the design. And again, you know, think of uh, you know, think of a website as like a major paper or any sort of major project that that you will do, and that is you want to have a plan going into it. All right, and that's all that web design is, is having a plan for what it is you're going to do. And then you go and you do that plan. All right, it doesn't mean you don't change the plan sometimes if you come up with new information or you get another thought or whatever. But it's better to start out with a plan than to just start out shooting from the hip. All right, so we, we defined last time that we're going to create a document that has five parts in it. And the first part is called strategy, and it focuses on the goals. So it all starts with goals, which sort of makes sense, all right? Um, but it is funny that when you read a lot of books about web design, you know, they start talking about colors and fonts and white space and things like that, which are important, but aren't the first thing that ought to be on your mind. So. Both the sponsors of the site, that is who is creating the site, and the users of the site are going to have goals. So in the first step, you define those goals. You define the goals for the organization, or whoever's creating the site, you define the goals for the users. Keeping in mind a couple things. First of all, almost every site is going to have a variety of users. There's not a single typical user that you could define for a website. There's going to be some people looking for one thing, some people looking for another, and so on. So that's why you come up with personas. And what are personas? They are fictional people that represent groups of your users. Now for this assignment, you need to come up with three. All right? And you need to come up with a set of goals, most primary concerns, the goals that the users of your site um, will be interested in. And uh, then you come up with goals for the organization. And the goals of the organization, um, the more specific, the better. You know, if you say the goal is to be more successful, well, yeah, of course you're trying to be more successful. All right? If your goal is to make more money, make more profit, yeah, that's, that's also a good goal, but again, not very specific. If, however, you say your goal is to increase your profits by 10% over the next year, that's a very specific goal and that's something you can measure. All right, a, a great management cliche is if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So, um, you know, if you say you're going to be more successful, well, what does that mean? You know, but if you say you're going to increase profits by 10%, you know exactly what that means. And you can't always do that. You can't always have goals as well defined as you might want them to be. But you still take a shot at doing that. All right. So that's the first step, the strategy step. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to define the five steps. The other four aren't going to take as long as strategy, but I'm going to define the other five steps. And then we're going to go through an exercise of creating a, a small plan for our hypothetical restaurant. And maybe I'll mail this video to all the restaurants I visited their website of over the weekend and couldn't find out when, if they were open on Sunday or not. <laughs> all right. So let's go and look at the design document again that is on Canvas. I'm down to saying canvas instead of angel, or angel instead of canvas only maybe one quarter of the time from like 50-50 at the start of the semester. So that's good. I'm sure I always will. 15 years from now, if we're still using canvas and I'm still here, I'll probably slip up once in a while and call it angel. Exactly. On the other hand, I don't slip up and call it what was before Angel, because I don't even remember what that was. Uh, 
That's a good question. I want to say it was WebCT, but I don't remember. So let's look at the design document. That's in the projects folder. So we've covered the first section, strategy. And we're going to go back and revisit this at the end of the lecture. But strategy should be the goals for the sites for you uh, and for your users, and a list of personas, which we'll talk about in a minute here. Scope. The scope describes what the project will do in as precise terms as possible. So, this gets to the old strategy and tactics, right? Your strategy could be to increase profits, all right? You could take a bunch of tactics to do that right? One tactic would be to raise your prices. That may or may not increase your profits, right? That would be one way to do it. Another way would be to lower your cost. Another way would be to get more sales, get more people coming in, and so on. So you want to take the approach of how you're going to achieve that goal. So in the case of a restaurant, um, one of the, one of the uh, things that you might want to do is, for example, you decide that some of the content you're going to have would be to offer online coupons. Okay? That would be a tactic that you could use to implement your strategy. If your strategy is to get more sales, offering coupons could be one way that you could do it. All right? You have to come up with a set of things for each of your requirements. Right? If you define something, uh, I'm sorry, for each of your goals, if you define something as one of the most, um, one of the most um, important goals for your site and you don't have anything on your site that helps you achieve that goal, then you miss the boat. All right? And the flip side is true as well. If you have something on your site and it doesn't really address one of the goals, then you miss the boat too. For example, chef biography. Should that be on a restaurant site or not? All right. I would say, again, if you are looking for, uh, if your goals and the goals of your users are to, to, to get a high-end dining experience, then yeah, maybe you publish the, the chef's biography and say all the places that they worked and, and where they went to school and so on and so forth, because that would help achieve your goal of portraying your restaurant as an elite restaurant. Whereas if you're, a, if you're just a diner, that's probably not a priority. So what you put on your site all depends on your goals and the goals of your users. All right? So whatever you have as a goal, there should be at least one thing or several things that help you achieve that goal. And that's the requirements. And the requirements are simply a list of things that you're going to put on your site. I'm going to put the menu on the site. I'm going to put um, a photograph of uh, the restaurant on the site. I'm going to put a, a map on the site. I am going to put our hours on the site. Uh -huh. I'm going to put the hours and days on the site, on the, on the front page of the site, and so on and so forth. So. That's all the requirement section is, is a list of the things that you're going to put on the site, the content that you're going to put on the site. And the content on the site should support the goals. All right? Why are you putting this on the site? Because you want to achieve this. And the hope is, is that the stuff that you choose to put on your site will help you and your users achieve their goals. All right? That's really the scope section. It's really just a list of a list of um, stuff that you plan on putting on your site. 
Now, one thing I will say is you don't need to put a definition of good web design as one of your requirements. So for example, your users want your site to have an, a, a good simple navigation, right? But you wouldn't put that as a requirement. Why? Well, that's like common sense, all right? So you're not going to say that my site will have a clear navigation. Well, of course it would. Why wouldn't you have good navigation? All right. So the requirements don't relate to design principles, but the requirements relate to content. All right. The, specifically, the content that you're going to put on the site to help the user achieve their goal. So there's no need for you to simply restate basic web design principles. My, my page will be easy to read. Well, yeah, of course it ought to be. Why would you not make your page easy to read? Um, and so on. Now, in the rare instance where you're going against a web design principle, maybe you'd put it in there. For example, if you were doing a site for a movie and you wanted the navigation to be a little fuzzy because you wanted people to really have a chance to immerse themselves in your site sort of like a game, maybe then you would say something like, well, the navigation will be uh, intentionally slightly misleading to help people you know, immerse themselves in it, all right? Or one of the basic design principles is that, you know, a serious site ought to look serious, a fun site ought to look fun. There's cases where you go sort of the opposite of that, right? Um, you, um, for example, um, with, the, with the site The Onion, a satirical news site, that's made to look like a real news site, all right? even though it's, it's meant to be a humorous site. So there's nothing on the site that, that points out that it is humorous, all right? And that's part of what makes it funny, that it looks like a real newspaper or a real news site, all right? So yeah, if you're going against a web design principle, and again, these are principles, these are guidelines, these are what are true most of the time, then you document it as part of your requirements. If, however, you're following Web Design 101, then there's really no need to mention that. The next step would be a structure diagram. All right? And a structure diagram looks like this. Looks like an organizational chart. So for my restaurant, maybe I'll have something like this. Here's the home page. Let's say I have multiple locations, all right? Each of these blocks represents a page on my site. So from the home page, you can go to a locations page, and then from there, you can go to the Lorraine restaurant or the Oberlin restaurant. Maybe here is my menu page, and you have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. All right. Maybe here is our catering information page, and so on. So, this is sort of the, this is what a, a structure chart is. All right where you simply define like from the home page, you go to locations, you go to Oberlin. Now, structure charts can be wide or they can be deep, all right? For example, you could have a bunch of pages off the home page. And so on. Throw a few more in there. Or you could have a structure that goes deep, where you have a home page that goes to this page and that page, and then this page goes to this page and that page, and so on down the line. So your structure chart could be 
could take one of these two basic shapes. Now, there's problems with each of them, right? And there's advantages with each of them as well. What's the problem with this kind of structure chart? Where you have pages that go deep. Many clicks. So to get to a page down here, you have to go from this page to this page to this page to this page to this page. All right. What's the problem with this? Too many, uh, too many possibilities on each page. All right. Let's think of a sporting goods store. Let's change our example for a second. And let's think of a structure chart that we could have. All right. Now, we could do this. We could say, I'm going to have my home page, and I'm going to have stuff for men, stuff for women, stuff for boys, and stuff for girls. Then underneath men, there could be, well, apparel. and equipment. Then underneath equipment there could be, you know, maybe categorized by sport. Men's golf clubs. I don't know. And then underneath apparel there could be shoes and clothes. Then underneath clothes there could be shirts shorts and so on. All right, so you see, in that you have a bunch of clicks to go down for it. Now, the other option would be have from your own page or an other option, I shouldn't say the other option, men's shoes, men's shirts. men's golf club or shorts, men's golf clubs, and so on. In that case, the, it would go wide. Now again, each of those has, has its potential problems, and this requires a bunch of clicks to get really anywhere. In here, you're presented with all the possible links that you could possibly get, and you have to go and, and pick the one that you want. Now, the one thing I will say at least about this is you have a bunch of simple choices to make, all right? But you have a lot of them to make. Here you have few choices to make, but the choice that you do have to make is a big choice, all right, between a whole bunch of options. Now, that's assuming that this is even the best way to organize this, right? Organizing it by men, women, boys, girls is only one way that we could organize the goods in a sporting goods store. What would be another way that we could organize the goods in a sporting goods store? By sport. So we could have our home page. We could have golf stuff. Basketball stuff. Softball stuff. And right down the line. And then we could subdivide those further into maybe equipment and apparel and men's, women, and boys, girls, whatever, all right? The idea is that this step, like every other step, requires choices to make. What pages you're going to have, how you're going to organize those pages, all right? Don't necessarily jump to the first thing that you think of, all right? And I'll give a for instance with this, you know. Um, when like pages uh, on a college's websites are organized by academic divisions, that doesn't make sense to most people out there because most people out there don't know what the academic divisions are at Learning Community College and therefore it would be difficult for them to see like where the computer courses are. So I want to organize it in a way that made sense to my users. That's one of the reasons you create those personas. You 
that allows you to put yourself in the user's shoes and say, this person, what do you think would best work for this person? What kind of uh, design? And again, that's not going to be foolproof, right? You're not mind readers. You know, you're just web designers. But at least if you can start thinking from another perspective other than your own, you stand a fighting chance of being able to develop something that's going to be usable for, for other people. On big websites, what they do is they do testing then. You know, they may develop a prototype, which I'll talk about in a minute here, and then bring people in and say, let's say you're looking to buy some golf clubs. You know, see if you can find golf clubs on our site. And they, and they can even track to see how many clicks it takes people to find golf clubs. All right, or whatever. Uh, and then they can make observations from that and decide, well, Maybe it's better organized this way instead of that way. So that's a structure. Structure relates to the pages that you're going to have and how they're going to um, link together, how they're going to be organized. The next area is the wireframe. And all the wireframe is, is a sketch, like an outline for what your pages are going to look like. So, for small websites, there's like a few sort of standard options, right? I could have a page that looks like this, have a banner on the top of the page that says, you know, Mike's Restaurant. could have navigation going down the side of the page like that with all my links. I could have a footer that contains our address, phone number, hours maybe, or something like that. And then finally I'm going to have the stuff that's going to be different on every page. Right? So all my pages are going to have the same basic layout. Because a restaurant's website, you know, most restaurants probably have about as many pages as your project does, you know, six to eight to ten in that neighborhood, you know. And therefore I can define this and say all my pages are going to look like this, all right. And that's all a wireframe is, is a basic explanation of we're going to put the header up here, we're going to put the navigation over here, we're going to put the footer down here, and we're going to put my content right here. Now you could organize it another, other different ways. You could have banner on the top, navigation here, content area, footer. If you have a large site, you might have a header on the top, a main navigation here, a sub-navigation here, the content, and then the footer on the bottom. So really all you're doing in the wireframe is you're, you're sketching out sort of the skeleton of the pages. All right, and then you're gonna, you'll fill in the details later. And filling in the details later is the creation of a prototype. And you need to do this for the design. Prototype for at least three of the pages using HTML and CSS. What is a prototype? Can someone define prototype? Or, or give a synonym for prototype? Test dummy. Test dummy. Okay. Mock-up. Anyone else? Those are good terms. Model is another term. The idea is, is that prototypes give everyone a good idea of how the finished site's going to look, but it's not the finished site. It's like a rough draft. Like on a term paper, a prototype would be the rough draft. All right? There should be enough in the prototype so people can look at it and comment on it and say, no, I don't like that color scheme. Uh, 
No, I would rather have the stuff positioned this way. No, that font is too big. No, that font is too small. Those boxes are too close together, and so on. We have to keep in mind why we create this design document. We create this design document for a couple reasons. One of them is that graph that I showed you. I think I showed this class about the cost of correcting something or changing something compared to the stage that you find the problem in. By the time the site goes live, it's very costly to make a change to your site. If I'm still designing it on paper, it's relatively inexpensive. That's true for software, that's always been true for software, and it always will be true for software. All right? And again, note that it doesn't simply increase, it increases at an increasing rate. So therefore, the cost increases very quickly. And the best analogy I can think of is if you're building a house, and you decided while the architect was still sketching it out that you wanted an extra bathroom. Yeah, that would add some expense to your project. However, if you built the house and were living in it and decided to add a bathroom, there'd be a lot more cost, not to mention the fact that you'd be hassled by having, you know, construction going on and so on and so forth in your house. So the idea is, is that we want to catch any oversights or corrections as early as we can. So how do we do that? Number one, we document it. And we let everyone involved in the project see it and comment on it. All right? So we define the goals. We define the requirements. We define the way we're going to have it laid out. And we define um, the wireframe. And we let people see that so they can say, well, gee, you forgot this. This is a very important goal. Or I don't really think you need this. Or maybe it would be better if you organize the pages this way. All right? So again, what you're doing really is you're giving a chance to get feedback before you've built that website. Now, while the documentation you can provide in the design is Um, one way to get feedback, for many people, actually seeing a living website, actually seeing it in their browser window, makes it real for them and lets them provide much better feedback than just seeing sketches on a sheet of paper or anything along like that. All right. So your prototype doesn't need to be finished. In fact, you don't want your prototype to be finished. Why don't you want your prototype to be a finished website? Because you can make it subject to change, right? If, you know, why go through all the effort to make your prototype perfect when your user might look at it and say, oh, that's horrible. Go and change this, change this, and change this. So you do just enough so that users, the people you're developing the site for, and, and other members of your project team can look at it and comment on it but not so much that you've wasted time making a perfect model. Models aren't perfect. That's why they're models, right? Um, so therefore, you spend enough time to make it such that people can comment on it, give everyone concerned a good idea of how it's going to look when it's done, how you're going to navigate through it, all right? But you don't have to have perfection. Not shooting for perfection at all here. In a way, developing websites like this, you have to develop a little bit of a thick skin, all right? Because you're liable to get feedback, you know, people can be brutally honest. And people can't always tell you what they want, but they can look at something and they can criticize it. And I don't mean criticize it like in a, in a, in a mean way, but they can, they can comment upon it. Um, examine it and, and point out its weaknesses or point out what they like or don't like and, and so on in it. It'd be like if you asked me to draw a perfect house. Um, you know, I don't know what my idea of a perfect house would be. I mean, I have some ideas, but I don't know. I can't really think of that. But, you know, if you took me around to, and showed me a few houses, 
I could say, you know what, I like the upstairs in this house, but I like the downstairs in this house. And, and this house would have been great if it had a bigger theater room, all right? Or this house would be great if it had a, uh, a, a built-in uh, quarters for the chef or something like that, right? So it's easier to look at something and to make suggestions to it than to dream up something from scratch. So your job as a web developer is to put out, in a way, sort of a straw man. Put out something that people can criticize and tear apart. And in doing that, you get the feedback that you need to take it to the next step and to develop something that they really do like. So it does require a little bit of having a thick skin. So the last part, the prototype, is actual HTML and CSS. You code some actual pages, not necessarily the entire page, but enough of the page for people to be able to comment on it and see what plans you have for, for taking the site, what direction you plan on taking the site. All right, let's go through an example for the next 15 minutes or so of if we chose to do a site for a restaurant, all right? And specifically, we're going to um, do a pizza. Um, yeah, we'll do, a, we'll, do a, we'll do a pizza place, all right? Yeah, that's good. Now again, one thing that is, is a little challenging in doing a project like this is you're both the person who is making the design and you're the person who you're making the site for, right? So in this case, I'm going to play the, the role of web designer. I'm also going to play the role of the owner of this pizza shop, all right? So I have a meeting with myself and I, I say, what are my goals? And I might define that I want my goals of the organization or sponsor goals is to, number one, sell more pizzas during weekdays. Monday through Thursday, right? Everyone eats pizza on weekends, right? Uh, and not as many people eat at that. So that'd be one way to sort of increase revenue would be, oh, let's get pizza to, you know, let's, let's, let's order pizza on Monday through Thursday. So that might be one goal. Another goal might be to increase catering business. In other words, do you know that if you're planning a party, we can bring you, you know, sheet pizzas for X amount of dollars, you know? So that might be another um, goal that this person has. All right? A third goal might be to... Um, appeal to the late night snack crowd, all right? So, you know, maybe the hours are late. Maybe they're open till like 11 p.m. So, you know, hey, you know. You're, you're, you know, you went to see a movie, you're hungry, come on in and, and have a bite, all right? And that might be a way to increase business. All right. The personas that we could talk about. We could talk about the Jones family. And again, you give these people names and you write a profile. You can go online and you can see examples of personas. Let's, let's do that.
So I'm just Googling web design personas. Closer look at personas and how they work, blah, 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 blah. All right. They make up Tom Brody. Wasn't Tom Brody a quarterback for someone, or am I? No, that's Tom Brady. Yeah, that's it. I say it didn't didn't sound right. And then of course there's John Brody going back into the 20th century. All right. But here's an example of um, a person, and they have a. I assume this is for like an auto part store or something like that, and. They write a whole story about them. All right. Here's another one. And again, you can Google to find some more examples of this. They talk about how to create personas, what are personas used for, and all that. So, one of my personas is going to be the Jones family that likes to go out and celebrate special occasions. I can never remember how to spell occasions. Are there two C's? Occasions. Yeah. And they even throw a lot of parties. All right. So, you know, they're just happy celebrating people. They're always they're always at a party, whether they're going out or they're they're having one at their home. All right. Maybe another one would be Fred, college student. Goes out with friends. On the lookout for a snack after a movie, etc. The last can be Sue, and Sue is, let's say, uh, out of town. Business traveler. Want something cheap, want something quick. All right, they get so much per day meal allowance, they don't want to go over that. Um, they want something that they can get to quick so they don't have to drive their rented car all over everywhere to find it. So they want something that they can get to easily and, and so on. So, what do you think these goals would be? Well, all of these people would have some similar goals, all right? We could look at the Jones family. Jones family might be, you know, one of the goals might be to investigate party planning options. 
So what, you know, do they have a banquet room? Is it one of those places that just has like a couple of small tables? Or is there a place where you could get like a dozen people around a table? Do they offer catering? Do they have dine-in? And maybe that's a better way to put it. Investigate dining options. Do they have dine-in, carry-out? What might Sue be interested in? Delivery to the hotel. And so on. So investigate the, the options for, for dining. All right? Another might be, once you've decided to eat there, planning a dining experience. So the first one sort of answers the question, one of my goals is visiting this site is, I want to figure out if I want to eat there or not. All right? I'm looking for a place to eat tonight for my kid's birthday party this weekend, whatever. Let me see if this is the right place for me. So that might be one of their goals in visiting your site. Is this the right place for me? And again, is this the right place for me could has implications as far as the price goes, the location, the dine-in options, the carry-out options, the delivery options, all that. Let's say we've decided to go there, planning a dining experience. Well, how do you get there? What are the directions? What's the location? Kid friendly. Exactly. And again, there's some overlap on some of these, but you get the idea that we're trying to look at all those different personas and figure out, like, what would help these people make their decision about this restaurant or plan their visit there? All right. Maybe, you know, a place, for example, like, like um, oh, wow, what, what is it? Uh, BW3. He might be interested in taking your family there earlier in the day, but later at night, maybe not, you know. So, to get a sense of what it's like would be that. Third thing might be like to, um, how do I want to say this? And there, there is some overlap in these because part of the investigate the dining options, one of the things might be to, to find out about the food. Someone planning a party might have people with different dietary restrictions. They might have lactose intolerant people. Gee, can they get, what are their options? They might have vegetarians or vegans. All right. They might have people that have religious dietary um, restrictions. All right. So finding out about the food. Gluten uh, allergies. All right. Finding out about the food and the ingredients and things like that could be important to these folks. So those would be the goals and that would be the strategy section. The scope section then, and again, I'm not going to do the whole thing, but the scope section would be writing the requirements. For example, I'm going to include a map. Include a photo. Include a menu. Include hours and days. Um, specials. Excellent. Late night special come in after 10. And like if you had a pizza place, say, that was like by the, what is that, Cobblestone Theater? Now come in after your movie, 
you know, a dollar off with your movie stub. Something like that. All right? And we could go on and define these. But when we're done, we better make sure two things. We better make sure, first of all, that our goals, both the goals of the organization and the goals of the users, all of these goals better be somehow addressed by our requirements. We said these are the most important things for our users. These are the most important things for us. Well, we better have something on our site that addresses those goals. The other thing would be to look and make sure if we have something that we're planning on putting on our site that doesn't really address one of those goals. Like in the case of a pizza place, maybe the chef biography isn't that important. All right? I and mean, it could be if you're talking about like one of those fancy pizza places, but you know what? I mean, that's usually not what people go to when they're looking for a pizza place. All right? So maybe, but maybe not. All right? Then we come up with a structure chart. We have a home page. And we can even define some of the content that's going to be on here. So maybe the, well, well, we'll leave that for now. The home page. About us. Menu. Specials and so on. Now again, we could do this a couple different ways and I want you to consider a couple options for how to organize the organizing principle of your sites. So investigate a few options and then say why you pick that one. All right. Explain what else you considered and why you think you, what you picked is, is better. Last is our wireframe. Now, for small sites, you might have the same wireframe for every single page. In other words, every single page might have the basic same layout. But you might have a, a few pages that follow a slightly different layout. What's common, for example, is for the home page to have one layout, everything else to have a different layout. So maybe for my place, I'm going to have two wireframes. I'm going to have the home page that has a banner a navigation a big picture of the restaurant the header would have things like the name of the place the location the hours, phone number, or you could put some of that in the footer if you thought it was a little less important. So my home page might look like that. Each of my content pages then might look like this. Oops, I didn't want to do that. I want to do my navigation this way. So how many wireframes will you have? You probably won't have one wireframe per page. You probably will have less wireframes than you have pages because some of your pages are likely to share the same layout, just with different content in them. All right? You might be able to get by with just one wireframe. I mean, we could do all our pages like this, even the home page if we wanted to, and that wouldn't be that bad of an idea. Maybe you have a couple wireframes in the case of you have a page or pages that you want to look different. A good example of that here might be maybe your menu pages look different as well, right? Because your menu you might want to print out or a coupon page you might want to print out. So maybe those pages are laid out a little bit differently. 
But you aren't going to have a, you don't need a separate wireframe for each page. There's going to be some consistency in your layout, or there ought to be, and therefore pages can share it. So for your assignment, for your project of, I think, eight to ten pages, I would think one, two, or three wireframes would be sufficient. Exactly. Exactly. Consistency is key, right. That's why if you had 12 different wireframes for a 12-page site, that's probably not a good idea because you're not going to be consistent. So maybe, and again, consistent doesn't mean identical, right? Um, so the home page and each detail page might have a slightly different layout, but they're not going to look like they come from two different sites. There'll be other things that will make them consistent, the color scheme um, and so on. The one thing that we're not going to do today, and we'll, we'll pick up on next time, is a prototype for this. All right, actually, and here's where you start doing all that stuff about, well, I, I want to take my wireframe and I want to create the HTML and CSS for it. All right. Um, I want to decide on things such as colors and fonts and, and that sort of thing. All right. At each step of the design process, there's choices. And those choices you ought to make deliberately instead of like just letting the chips fall where they are. All right? So deliberately decide the font, the colors, and so on. At each step, you, you decide what the goals are. You have those choices. You choose what content you're going to put on the site. You're going to choose how it's going to be organized. And you're going to choose how it's going to be laid out. So consider all the options and make the best choice on each one of those for your project. Monday we'll start um, talking about taking your wireframe and making a prototype from it. And we'll go through the process of creating sort of a template for our pages. Then we'll clone that template to have all the pages on our site. And we might as well continue this example. Again, we won't necessarily build a complete site, but we'll build the shell of a restaurant's um, site. And then you would just need to fill in the specific content. All right, any questions? All right, we'll see you over in lab then.